All right, so thank you again for joining me in this workshop about how to create a sense of belonging in your online course. So we have just um, a couple of things to go over and then we can dive into some of these different concepts that we can take a look at as well as tools to help you. So on our agenda today, we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at inclusion versus belonging. Um, they do pair very well together, uh, but there's a slight distinction between the two. So I just kind of wanted to take a look at that. We're going to talk about why belonging is just so important, particularly in this online format. I have um, seven different strategies for you to assist you, as well as some hopefully helpful tips um, and technologies that you can use. And then, of course, the formal Q&A at the very end. Uh, but please feel free to stop me at any point. You can type in the chat if you're more comfortable with that, or you can hop on the microphone. So whatever format works best for you. Um, and then our final wrap up. All right. So I thought since we're going to be talking about inclusion and belonging, we were probably going to need to start with a couple of working definitions. Um, so I just swiped this one from Wikipedia because I felt like this was generally a, a pretty good definition. So you should see that up on the screen. So again, our inclusive classroom, it's really just kind of this inviting place where everybody is welcomed. All right, so now I get to hear from you. If you wouldn't mind, um, again, either you can type in the chat or you can turn on your microphone, um, but pick a topic here. Either how do you define student belonging or option B, um, what's a quick tip that you recommend to boost inclusivity in your course? I can start um, with option A in terms of how I define student belonging. Um, I think in terms of students feeling belonging, I think they need to feel welcomed, um, but also not only acclimating within the community, but being themselves in that process, I think is important um, to, to be comfortable sharing their own personal opinions, their own thoughts on the topics that we discuss. I think once you create that um, type of environment, students be become more uh, having that sense of belonging in terms of what they can say in the classroom or how they feel as part of our discussion and being comfortable with who they are as individuals, but also uh, comfortable sharing their thoughts and opinions on the topics that we discuss in our course. That's great. I love that definition. Wikipedia should hire you. Uh, and I'll just go quickly with option B. Um, similar to what Farah just said too, so what I do for just a, a quick tip on recommending or boosting the inclusivity, what I do a lot in my lecture slides, for example, I pro so we're both in sport management, but I try to have images that are representative of various different types of sports, um, as well as different types of ethnicities and races to um, address more our student population. But then I also include myself in discussions and lead with personal examples that have happened to me to further engage in discussions, but also showing students what um, I have been part of to make them feel more relatable to what we talk about in class as well. Great, thank you. I love that idea as well. I know when we think about incorporating course materials, sometimes, yeah, we do need to take a closer look at, you know, who is being presented or who authored something. Um, so yes, absolutely. It, creates a more inclusive environment when people can actually relate to to some of these contributors. So thank you. All right, so now that we kind of kick started that, I think we have kind of a working definition for inclusion, um, but now we also need to take a look at, at what student belonging is. And I definitely think this is in line with what both of you were saying. Uh, you know, we want our students to feel, yes, personally accepted to be seen as individuals. So hopefully this will work as a, a good working definition for you. Um, I think this will kind of just for the sake of this workshop to have kind of something concrete to go off of. Uh, 
All right, so you may be thinking about, well, why does student belonging matter or you know what else does it contribute to and so as most of us are aware um, there is a higher drop withdrawal uh, failure rate um, affiliated with online programs and many are um, experts will argue that this issue kind of stems from students feeling disconnected to their school uh, it could be their courses or even their peers so Ideally, if we can break this barrier and promote this feeling of belonging, um, then we may see a variety of improvements. And so some of these things could include you know, increased student satisfaction. Um, you know, a lot of times we look at our uh, course surveys and evaluations at the end of a semester to see what our students think. Um, so we might see an improvement there. We could see lower attrition rates, right? No more, you know, people just kind of disappearing and falling off the grid. We're going to see more student success, um, deeper connections to their coursework, the social connections that they're going to have with their peers, um, and also improve communication skills. So I know those are kind of the, the backbones of, of why the student belonging matters. Um, and so now we can actually do kind of like the deep dive and we can take a look at some of these different tips that we have for you. All right, so um, this first one that I wanted to bring up for you um, it deals a lot with um, inclusivity. And while I do think that there is a difference between being inclusive um, and helping a student feel like they belong. I, I don't know if I would say that they're mutually exclusive. I do think that they're um, kind of roped together. So this is a tool that I just wanted to bring to your attention because it's relatively new and uh, we always look for ways so that our technology can support us. So some of you may have noticed that there is uh, kind of a new look to Blackboard in your courses. And this is because we have now, since uh, this past December, enabled Blackboard Ally in all Blackboard courses. Um, and this is regardless of whether you're using Blackboard Ultra or Blackboard Original. And so you may have observed that there's kind of a capital A next to some of your files. I took a little bit of a screenshot here, kind of put it glowing in orange for you to see. So if you've ever seen this in your course and you're wondering what it is, this stands for Blackboard Ally. And this is just to help us know and alert our students as well um, that they can see their course content in multiple file formats. So you might ask yourself, well, why do I need multiple file formats? Um, but one example is that if you have students with visual impairments, they may be using some type of an e-reader device. And certain files are more accessible and easy to read than others. So if we have multiple file formats um, available, then they can just choose the one that works best for them. We also know that students in general will pick and choose which file format they prefer. If they're given an option, they, they generally will take a look at them. So um, our studies indicate that students will choose whatever works best, maybe for their own unique device settings, um, what works well for me on a PC may not work well for somebody else on a Mac. So Ally's already been enabled for you and students can already just pick and choose from the file formats. Excuse me as I sneeze. Um, the other thing that Blackboard Ally does is it helps you look at your course as far as accessibility. So let me switch gears here. Have any of you ever seen this before? I'm just kind of throw that out there. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have actually not seen this one before, but I know that we've had. Um, I've taken a few courses on the idea of making things more accessible for students, for example, instead of including a table on the syllabus, rather spelling everything out. Um, that was one of the things. And just always checking um, PowerPoint slides. So what I do, for example, is 
I do um, a colorful version with uh, tons of pictures and everything that I use to teach in the classroom that I also make available on Blackboard, but then I also make do a pure black and white slideshow with no pictures um, based on accessibility um, expectations and requirements to, to make sure that, and I tell my students whatever you work best with, just choose that version. Absolutely great. Thank you. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, that is exactly kind of what Ally looks at for you. Um, so I wanted to bring this up here. Um, as you can see, I took a screenshot of my sandbox, which clearly is not a, a real course. Um, but even so, it, it gives me a display here and it says that it you know, it's in the green, it's good. It says it's 85%, um, but there are things that I could do for improvement for accessibility. So I do wanna highlight um, Blackboard Ally only displays this accessibility score to you um, as the instructor or the faculty member. Students don't see this, um, but this is kind of a cue for where you might improve the overall accessibility of your Blackboard course for your students. So when you click on the score, you can learn about those various areas of improvement. Um, for instance, you know, do your images and links have description tags? Um, if not, then you may wanna add these so anybody with that e-reader device can access the information. Um, so even if you have never attempted to add a descriptive tag, Blackboard Ally kind of will walk you through that process step by step. Uh, so if you're wondering where to find this, um, again, it could be a little bit different depending on whether you're using Original or Blackboard Ultra. But for Blackboard Original, you would go to the gray control panel on the left side of your course. You would scroll down to uh, Course Tools and then you would find the accessibility report. I think it's the very top option. For any Ultra users, um, similar process, you would go to books and tools, and then you would go to the accessibility report. So I will be sending out some follow-up information after this workshop um, about Blackboard Ally, but it's just kind of a great way to find out maybe what does your course look like through the eyes of a student? But it's not just all about tools, it's also about pedagogy um, and different things that we can do with our students. Right. So this idea here is about gamification. And one thing that our department noticed, Seidel, um, during the pandemic is that many instructors struggled with engaging their students in an online setting. So they reported that students were acting withdrawn, and the instructors themselves struggled with measuring or gauging their students' performance. So if you find yourself in a similar situation, I would first consider outlining your approach to teaching online. Um, start by determining how are your students going to engage with the course? Um, is it going to be synchronous sessions, such as you know every Thursday night at six o'clock, they're going to meet with you uh, either via Zoom, Collaborate, or Teams? Or are they going to be working asynchronously where they're going to be doing their coursework independently, um, but they'll just be submitting things by established due dates? Or is it going to be a mix of the two? So that's kind of the first step. Next, if you've primarily taught in a face-to-face -face setting, you might want to envision how you would approach your in-seat class. So for instance, would there be activities, group projects, um, student presenters, guest speakers? Would you be lecturing? Um, would it be a hands-on lab environment? So all these different things, what would you be doing? And so after you've done that, then I, I would take a moment and I would ask you to consider your online environment because I think this is how many of us have come to online teaching. Is first we started in a face-to-face -face scenario and then we moved to this online classroom environment. And I'd ask you to consider the different factors that may affect your course design. So, for instance, if we were talking about a synchronous session, you can use webcams, but they can also feel invasive, right? All of a sudden, now you have people's homes in the picture, their, their kids, their spouses, their significant others are running around in the background. We get photobombed by pets, right? 
Um, so they can present barriers um, when there are also multiple users in the home. For instance, if you have um, a lot of people online and they're drawing on the internet bandwidth. So maybe you don't want to use the, the webcams. Uh, and then you have to think about how your students are going to interact with you. They could type in the text chat, but they're also missing out on that social aspect of speaking informally to their peers just in passing. And you might also ask yourself, how are you going to be interacting with your students? You might become exhausted with lecturing kind of into an empty abyss is how it was described to me by another faculty member. Um, where once you would maybe pause and make eye contact, now you're staring at a blank web conferencing screen. So I know it's a lot to think about, but now that you've thought about your course and some things that may not be working in your favor, you can start to reimagine your lesson plan a little bit. So it's not that teaching online is better or worse than teaching face-to-face, -face, but it is a different format. And so you do want to adapt and consider using different strategies for these different scenarios. So the first idea that I want to introduce is gamification, as promised. And it is a deliberate strategy to help students engage with their coursework. So instead of being passive bystanders, they participate in a challenge or an exercise. It can be presented uh, for asynchronous or synchronous course formats. And some of them can be completed as a team or there are other activities here that could be completed um, solo or independently. So why do we use gamification? Well, it is fun for our students, and we know statistically speaking that if somebody enjoys their coursework, they're more likely to excel in it. It's engaging, they have to do something. It introduces problem solving skills, it can build confidence, uh, students are self-motivated, it does encourage growth um, and even revision. If they don't get it right the first time, can they try it again? So what are some different concepts that we could do? Even though your students are not sitting in front of you, consider sending them on a scavenger hunt. What can they find in the field around them? Um, it's a great way for them to explore their surroundings and to report back to you. You can introduce things like trivia games. Another idea is you can award uh, badges and titles. This can serve a couple of different purposes. Uh, one, if it's just a badge or a title that has no bearing on their grade, again, it does help build confidence. It's a low stakes environment, um, but it also can help students self-regulate their coursework. If they receive a badge, then they know that they've completed this exercise and they're ready to move on to the next one. You can again ask your students to do field assessments. Even though you're not in a classroom, a lot of laboratory um, kind of simulations can take place in their own home. Some other in, uh, themes that we can introduce would be to come up with a classroom theme. Similarly, you can send your students on challenges and quests, or we call them choose your own adventure. A big part of andragogy and teaching adults is to allow them some choice. So what do they want to do? Uh, which path do they want to explore? You could do a classroom feud. Basically, it's a family feud via PowerPoint. Um, now, that one typically does work best for groups of students and in a synchronous session, but that's still a possibility. And the other idea here is to use NIU's video platform, Kaltura, and you can turn your lectures that you've recorded into interactive video quizzes. So this serves, again, two purposes. It engages students, but it also lets you know who has watched your video material. Um, I know that was a big concern that we had during the pandemic. I, you know, I spent all this time recording my PowerPoint. Did they watch it? Um, so this is a great way just to get them involved with the lecture content. Have you ever tried any of these at all or considered them? I have um, actually today I did, it was an online class, but I've done it in uh, online class before. Um, but I did like a midterm Jeopardy review. 
and I uh, utilized like the Jeopardy Labs um, online version and then had them uh, go to a website called Buzz In uh, where they can yep. register and I can see like who buzzes in first and all that good stuff. Um, in the online classes that I've used it before, I would put them into like breakout rooms. That would be their team. Um, and then they're kind of released to the main room and then um, they know who's on their team and they kind of work together um, on that, utilizing that buzz in uh, feature along with the Jeopardy review that I put together. I love it. Um... You know, you just remind me of another one. Um, another thing that I have seen instructors do is they'll create virtual breakout rooms as study sessions. Um, and I've seen this done a couple of different times, but um, I saw a great example. If you're interested, I can always throw you a link to it. I believe it was um, a librarian who created a breakout room all to the theme of Harry Potter, um, but everything was a problem solving exercise. You know, when you got to the math problems, you were in the potions class kind of a thing. Yes, absolutely. So it's this idea that even though we're online, uh, we can have our students do things and you don't have to just stand there and lecture and record. So, thank you for sharing. I'm very excited to hear about that. Another option that we have for helping our students to kind of develop the sense of belonging with our course is to ask them to start submitting original work. Now, I know this can get tricky, particularly if you have a large roster. Um, so there are different strategies that we can adapt for that. Um, but we are going to look for ways that students can craft or build their own content um, and aid students in taking ownership of their education. You know, they're going to feel more empowered to apply their knowledge to either create a tangible product or um, to take that knowledge and analyze, you know, a relevant concept. So some different ideas that I have for this. Um, you know, and it can take on different forms. Um, when we say student work, you don't have to make everything a graded activity. I do want to emphasize that I'm not trying to boost your grading workload. Um, so some of these can also just be daily icebre icebreaker activities, pardon me, um, or they can be, of course, graded activities as well. So I think one of the standards that has come about is this idea of using the LMS or you know the Blackboard discussion board and um, a standard way to use this is you'll ask your students to submit their own original uh, response to a question and then after they've done that to go back in and respond to their peers and this has kind of become the standard format uh, but there are other things that we can use the discussion boards for uh, for instance you can ask your students to upload their own video recordings, which um, is a great way for people to get to know their peers, right? Um, you can ask them to go out into the field and take a recording. Now you may be asking yourself, well, how do I know if my students have technology to handle this? And we've learned that there, there's a wide range of technology amongst our students. But the one thing that we do know is that most students have a cell phone. So we do have a free mobile application for our NIU video platform, Kaltura, and the um, mobile app, which I've actually used, and I'm, I'm not paid to sponsor this, um, but I was actually really enjoying it. It's called KMS Go. And you can take this, um, put it on your phone, it's free. They have it for Androids, they have it for iPhones. Um, and as soon as you start taking a video recording, it uploads to your account and students can then just add it to the Blackboard discussion board. Why would they do that as opposed to just submitting their video recording to you as an assignment? Well, remember, if we put it in the discussion board, then they get to view all of their peers recordings as well. So it, it's really engaging for everybody when we do it that way. You can ask students to locate things like found art and field pictures. If you want students to analyze something and to use their critical thinking skills, consider distributing random case studies. 
Um, you can ask students to use their coursework to analyze contemporary topics. So uh, my one example of this is our nursing department. I worked with an instructor during the pandemic who asked students to go out and look at um, all the different types of personal protective equipment that people were using during COVID, you know, before the vaccines became available uh, when we were at, you know, kind of the height of the pandemic. So these nurses went out and they started looking at how people were trying to protect themselves. And so then they were able to discuss what they've learned as nurses, what they know about virus protection and how they can apply it. Okay, another example is um, a shark tank. So instead of you always leading the discussion, invite your peers to come into your classroom and to ask them to, um, you know, look at your students' work. Uh, these are gonna be unbiased professionals and they're going to evaluate them. So uh, I think I've seen this done in an advertising course. Everybody was uh, divided up. They, they became part of a group and each group had a product and they had to come up with the best slogan for their product. And then the Shark Tank professionals, you know, I use the term Shark Tank loosely, uh, but the panel came in and they were able to vote on it and to give them tips about how to market towards their uh, preferred audience. And last but not least, you might also consider using an anonymous peer review. So the peer review is great for if students need to uh, look at their coursework and to respond to their peers. Instead of you having to grade everything, they can use a rubric and they can provide feedback. All right, questions so far? Uh, my next idea here is that we can also introduce mandatory office hours. So when we can't physically observe our students, uh, we may miss that opportunity to identify areas where they are either struggling or um, we might not notice the red flags um, that they're about to kind of, you know, encounter some type of a conflict, uh, maybe. And sometimes students won't reach out for help. Uh, possibly even worse, they may not even realize they need help until after they receive a poor grade. So um, a nice way to try to avoid this pitfall together is just to ask your students to come meet with you virtually. Um, and you'll want to do this at a couple of different times in your course. So, um, and I'll admit I was guilty. I, I was probably the first person who said uh, office hours by appointment, but I missed an opportunity to get to know my students. So um, you can do this early on in the semester and you're going to ask your students to come and meet with you, even if it's just for a few minutes. They can hear your voice, they can see your face, they can see who you are as an individual. Um, and then you can ask them, what are your expectations for the course? After that first meeting, um, you're gonna want to start to make the, these meetings a little more structured. So you're going to want to ask them to come with their own agenda, or you can even post an agenda for them ahead of time. Um, but you can ask students to reflect on things like, what have they completed? What did they struggle with? Ask them to analyze their own progress, um, their own critical thinking skills, areas for improvement, et cetera. Um, so when I do this, I typically will schedule my meetings through Office 365 um, just because it's easier for me to kind of get this overview of my weekly calendar. So that's kind of what I have a picture of up on the screen there. Um, students will sign up and meet with you during specific slots, um, but then you don't just sit there and wait around all day for somebody to come talk to you. Uh, they have their own assigned time. And you can also introduce mandatory office hours um, as a, something where if you notice that somebody's having trouble, then they can also, you know, schedule more appointments with you. 
Um, or if you've noticed that somebody did poorly on a large stakes assessment, um, you can maybe for in those special circumstances ask that they visit you again, uh, but it would be confidential and nobody else would know about it. Just curious, does anybody else do that too? Or did, did you do office hours by appointment or mandatory? Uh, Maggie, so what I did, um, similar to you at the beginning too, I just had um, office or yeah, office hours by appointment. And usually none of my students would ever even request, well, occasionally they would request to have a meeting. But then what I did for the online section too was uh, that they had to sign up with me twice during the semester to meet with me regardless of just kind of checking in. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I did to meet with them. I mean, I appreciate what you're doing there too. I, I've also seen it where instructors will say, I will pass back your essay or your project when you meet with me. <laughs> so that's another way to in entice them to come see you is would you like to know your score? Um, okay. So just curious about that. I always am curious to see what works well for other people. Um, moving on to that is what I kind of call the water cooler conversations, uh, which is basically just an informal discussion. And that's something that we miss out on a lot, I think, with our online classes. So in a face-to-face -face environment, students could walk in, they could, you know, greet their, their friends, they could sit down and start a conversation with somebody next to them. And so we lose that a little bit in this online environment. Um, so we can kind of create that environment for them. It should still be a civil and respectful environment, uh, but it's not really class related or class themed. And so these are discussions that hopefully can lead to building connections. Um, and I encourage you not to view them as something extraneous. So um, one way that you can do this is you can create um, an ungraded discussion forum and that just gives people a place to, to get to know each other. Um, you could give it a focus or a topic. And these are typically things that people are just easy to, to talk about, right? Um, I have a colleague who insists on doing a pet parade and at the start of every class, everybody submits pictures of their pets. Um, and this could be things like hobbies, family, cultural traditions. Uh, you can encourage them to upload photos. And so an example that I have of this, um, and this was actually from one of my own instructors, was um, she started off a course and they did a similar thing. They opened up uh, the discussion forum and they asked some question like, what is your favorite dessert? And she said it was an orange. And her peers were kind of shocked and somebody even said, I didn't know that was considered a dessert. And she said, well, I'm from Japan. And she was just like, I, I don't really know what some of your desserts are. And her peers actually got together, picked her up, and took her to Dairy Queen. Um, at which point she was told she needed to order, I think it was um, a chocolate chip cookie dough um, blizzard. And, and she was very confused by it because she felt like there was a lot going on. There was cookie dough and there was ice cream. Uh, she actually picked out the uh, chocolate chip cookie dough chunks um, and tried to bake them. But um, this was actually one of the ways that she got to know all of her peers. Everybody was fascinated. They'd been eating this their entire life and not one of them had ever thought what would happen if you baked the cookie dough. And uh, she didn't actually realize that there were no eggs in it. So she said it was still tasted okay, but um, it was flat. So again, just a way that these students built connections. Um, you know, she could have been very isolated. She didn't really know her peers, um, but through just this informal discussion, um, she, she bridged those kind of barriers and, and she got out there and got to know who was in class with her. So it was kind of one of those unforgettable moments. My next example for you is really ideal for a synchronous course session. Um, it's just a way to explore cultural differences and similarities um, and also to express individuality. So, you know, consider how your students may currently enter your synchronous online course. Um, do they come in with their microphones muted? What do they see on the screen? Um, and so well, there's nothing wrong with starting a course with a PowerPoint slide or some course content. Um, consider how you can make this 
you know, an inviting virtual space. Your students uh, may be physically isolated, but they can identify their course, um, you know, through other means. So how do we go about this? Um, again, this is a great, you know, activity for start of a semester, but ask your students to help you cultivate a playlist. I recommend providing guidance and clarity on what is considered a classroom appropriate song, um, but ask them to submit one to two songs each. Um, at the start of every class period, you can start by playing a random song from the list. If it's appropriate, you could even um, show it, you know, as a YouTube video, if there's a, a music video that corresponds with it. Um, and then you can also use songs, like things like to signal that it's the end of a break, right? Uh, these virtual sessions can go on a long time. So a nice way to break that up is to give them, you know, a five or 10 minute bathroom break. And when you're ready to resume course work, um, just let them hear the music and it'll draw them back into the class. Um, you can make sure that your students don't know whose song is going to be played every day. Uh, or you can invite conversation. You can ask, does anybody want to talk about, you know, why you picked this song. Um, that's up to you. All right, our next one here, and this is, I think, our, our seventh one, so we're doing really well on time, um, is that you can create a study group for your students. Um, and this is how you can help your students prepare for exams and large stake assessments um, by creating a space for a student-governed study group. Uh, so that's something that I do want to emphasize here. It's something that you would facilitate, but you wouldn't be the moderator, if that makes sense. Um, so you can create this virtual meeting space ahead of time for your students. And before that study session, you can distribute a study guide and maybe even some practice exam material. And then you can ask your students to compare notes and prepare for the exam. Um, but again, this is um, a space where no attendance is taken. It's completely voluntary. And optionally, as an instructor, you can agree to attend the last 10 minutes of the study session. So, you know, if they have any unresolved questions that they could not answer as a study group, then you can provide clarification. But again, I would recommend keeping your visit brief uh, because you want to let them know that you're there for support. Um, but ultimately, this is a student led group. So, um, and I did put up on the screen here an example of how to do this with Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, my mind always goes there just because that's built into your Blackboard course. Um, so if you've never done this before, uh, if you've never given ownership of a virtual session to your students, this is one way that you can do it. So um, when you go to create your uh, Blackboard Collaborate session, you would enable the guest access. That's the first red asterisk that you see. Um, so anybody who has that link can join the session. Um, and then you just uh, change the guest role to um, moderator. And that means that they are the owners of the session. So you would give this um, study group link out to your students. You could post it in a module in your course. You could send it in an email. Um, but whoever clicks on that link, they're the owner of the session, which means you know, if they want to go back and review all the things they covered in their study session, uh, they can, you know, they could see the recording. So um, lots of different ideas there. But again, it's this idea that you've created a space where they're going to work together as a group. It's a no pressure environment. Um, if you're thinking about it ahead of time, you could even ask your students um, to fill out a survey and tell you what day are they available or what time would be ideal for this meeting. Potentially, maybe you could even cancel class and just say, hey, it's an optional study group day. Um, so you've got lots of different options there. So I know we're, um, we're getting pretty much close to end time here. We can get out a few minutes early. Um, I did find this quote. I know sometimes quotes are kind of corny, but I really thought this was a good one. Is there anything that I can answer for you or 
Are you looking for specific suggestions or tips? Uh, not from my end, Megan. Thank you so much for taking the time and presenting that to us today. That was definitely helpful and gave me some ideas because I'll probably be teaching an online course over the summer. But yeah, right. definitely incorporating some of those approaches. Wonderful. Likewise, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. You are very welcome. I'll stop the recording. I'll hang around. If you have anything you want to talk about, let me know. Otherwise, um, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.